work that they've been doing with one of their districts uh, that used a remote learning platform this spring, and they were able to analyze some of that data and um, understand a little bit more about how data from that platform can help us think about engaging students and thinking about student participation. Um, so our hope is that that hearing from them will generate some ideas on our end and help us think about the kinds of data that we all have access to and, and how we can use that to support districts, schools, and students. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to turn things over to Dave Hirsch and Lisa Sonbanmatsu, who will present this morning. Uh, just a few sort of technical issue, technical notes. Um, I want you to all know that this webinar is going to be recorded, and we will share that recording after um, the the presentation so that if you want to watch again, you'll be able to. And if some of your colleagues are not able to catch it this morning, they'll have an opportunity to see it as well. We'll also be sharing the slides um, after the meeting, so you can kind of take a look at those. During the meeting itself, during the webinar itself, please feel free to um, engage in conversation in the chat box if you have questions that come up. We'll certainly be pausing um, throughout to uh, address questions and um, try to set aside time at the end for questions, but throughout, please feel free to use that chat box and we'll keep an eye on that um, and address questions as they come up. We really are looking forward to an engaging discussion with all of you about this data and its implications and uses. Um, the you uh, should all be, I think, I think you're all muted at the moment. Um, we just ask that folks remain on mute while you're not speaking. Um, and uh, you can see sort of in the presentation here, there's a few tips on how we can help all, all help make this presentation go smoothly. Um, go ahead and turn off your videos. That'll help with bandwidth. Um, and then you can follow along and tweet about today using these Twitter handles here on the screen. Um, again, I don't want to say a whole lot because I want to preserve our time um, for Dave and Lisa to share what they have been working on, what they've learned, and have some discussion with you all. But just thank you again for spending your time with us this morning. Dave, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Heather. Uh, and uh, I'll just echo your thanks to everybody. We know how crazy a time this is for everybody involved in education and uh, we're just happy to see so many people on. Um, uh, uh, and as Heather noted, uh, I'm joined here today by uh, Lisa Sanbenmatsu, who is our analytic lead at the Center for Education Policy Research. Uh, I'll be doing most of the presenting, but uh, Lisa will be sort of our point person for any technical questions that arise. Uh, she and her team do, uh, do all the kind of deep dive analytic work. Um, we also have a couple other folks from uh, from the Proving Ground team here uh, on, and uh, some of you may have interacted with them already or seen us at various events. Um, but uh, we have uh, Jen Ash uh, and Katie Kinniger uh, on as well. Uh, unfortunately, in my presentation mode, I actually can't see the screen at all, so I have no idea if they're waving at you or saying hello. Um, uh, but they are also on and available. Uh, Jen and Katie work with uh, our 19 rural partners in Ohio. Uh, and then uh, we also, uh, I hope, uh, but I can't see, have uh, Amber Humpatnode on, who works with our three uh, larger urban partners in Ohio. Um, are the uh, I should make a quick note uh, because I can't tell if she's on or not, um, but the analyst on our team who did all the amazing work that I'm going to share with you today uh, and makes me look good by giving me something to share with you. Uh, her name is Rachel Lee. Uh, Rachel, if you're on, um, do you feel free to turn off your uh, the, turn on your video and just give a quick wave. Uh, uh, but Rachel got sick this morning, so she may not actually be on. I don't know yet, um, um, but Rachel did all the all the hard work here. Um, as Heather noted, um, uh, we will be relying mostly on the chat window because there are so many of you uh, and also because, as I noted, I can't see uh, see if anybody's talking. So if you're waving or hollering, um, I won't know it. So I'm going to pause periodically uh, and the team's going to monitor the chat window and just make sure we don't miss any of your questions. Uh, don't be shy about asking questions throughout. Uh, while we do have uh, plenty of content to cover, I think the most important thing is being able to to have that interactive conversation and answer any questions that you all have. Uh, the content's not going anywhere. And so if we don't get to everything, um, uh, we can always follow up more later. And we can, uh, as, as Heather noted, we'll be sharing both the video and, uh, and, and the deck. And so there's nothing on here that you won't be able to see if we don't get to it in the uh, 51 minutes we have remaining. 
so with that, uh, I'm just going to dive, uh, give a quick overview of what to expect uh, of the presentation. Um, it's a little ambitious for 51 minutes, but uh, but I think it's I think it's manageable, and I think we tried to hit the the sort of key points uh, or the minimum needed to to kind of take next steps. Uh, I'll note that the goal from today's meeting is not that you'll come out of this meeting suddenly uh, suddenly able to do all of the stuff that we were able to do with this partner. We've been working on this for a very, very long time. Um, the goal, rather, as, uh, as Heather highlighted, is uh, to offer an example of something that is imminently possible with the data districts have been generating and are going to continue to generate over the next year. Um, and uh, and sort of plant the seeds uh, for you all of what's possible, so that if you're interested in doing it, uh, you can you can follow up and, and kind of take next steps. And so we're uh, we're going to dive in, in 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 a few different ways, but we are going to cover not just the outcome of what's happening, but also the sort of how the how we did it and some considerations for doing it yourself. Um, so the big picture overview is uh, one of the many, many unfortunate consequences of COVID-19 is that it left educators without many, many of the data points that uh, we have come to rely on as educators, and maybe we don't even realize just how much we rely on, we rely on them. And uh, while there are many, many data points like that, one of the most critical that we've lost is actually maybe the simplest data point, which is attendance. You know, our students coming to school, uh, we use that in so, so many ways. We use it as an early warning indicator to identify students in need of additional intervention. Uh, we use it as a predictor of, uh, of test outcomes long before you've administered a test. Um, obviously, there's all kinds of truancy implications and your house bill implications of, of attendance. Um, but from our per perspective, the most important ones are sort of the formative ones, right? What do we use this data for? Uh, to inform uh, inform the action we take in support of students. Um, so, insofar as students stopped physically coming to school, most states, like Ohio, decided to waive the requirement of reporting attendance in the standard way, right? Districts were essentially marking every student as present for regulatory purposes for the rest of the school year, and that left us with essentially none of this data, none of this amazingly useful uh, formative data uh, that we've had for so long. Um, and while we didn't obviously have a ton of time to, to rectify that or kind of fill that void uh, perfectly in the, in the few months after, uh, after school shut down for COVID-19, um, we were able to do enough to start building a picture of what is possible for next year and how even if we end up in a, a hybrid or even fully virtual world for some of some of next year, we don't need to be left in this vacuum, in this void of this, this highly usable data. So I'm going to share just one example of the type of analysis you'll, you can do with school district data. And I'll note that these are data that is possible with, uh, with what districts are collecting sort of anyway. Um, and, and I mean that in, in two ways. One is based on the recent um, kind of very thoughtful, very strong guidance ODE recently issued on tracking attendance for next year, uh, your, your school district should be, uh, should be capturing this data in their SIS somehow. But also because they've started to ramp up for at least the possibility of some part-time remote learning, uh, districts are going to be using platforms that are automatically generating the type of data that we're going to share today. And so uh, in either case, you should have the data exists. And so really what we're talking about is, uh, is how, to, how to engage with that data in a way to make it actionable to districts in a way that's sort of analogous to how attendance data has always been actionable to districts. Um, so very, very brief agenda. I've sort of... Uh, uh, mentioned this already, um, we're using one example of what is really an infinite number of possible things you could do with the data that districts are going to be generating over the next year or so. Um, but I'll give, I'll dive into the example so you can see what's possible, what we did with it. Um, I'll dive into the data sources we use to create it, the methods and tools we use to, to create it. Uh, and then we'll close out with some basic uh, considerations as you think about things you might do with data you're getting from districts or 
things you might do to help districts with their own data, um, uh, these considerations are useful as you as you consider those things. I'm going to pause there just to, since I can't see the chat window. I'll just pause and let somebody holler at me if there are any any questions in the chat window at the moment. There are no questions yet. Awesome, thanks, Heather. Uh, so I'm going to start, as noted, with the results of the analysis that we generated, um, and uh, I'm going to go through sort of a quick bullet point overview. And then show uh, show some kind of pretty charts that uh, Rachel Lee generated for us on our team. Um, and again, I'll just note uh, that the reason these charts are sort of think of these as inspiration for what's possible, not necessarily recommendations for the the exact or the only thing you could do. Uh, so the overview is uh, we we kind of broke the analysis up into two pieces. The first was uh, the partner we did this with was interested in knowing sort of who was logging in, when were they logging in, and are there patterns regionally to where they're not logging in? And the regional pattern piece was important and sort of distinct from how attendance has usually worked in that there's there were obviously many hypotheses about students not having access to internet in certain regions of the city, things like that. Uh, and so being able to impose a geographic lens on this was actually really important. So I'll be showing you sort of what we did and we'll talk a little bit about how we, we did that. Um, but in addition to wanting to see where and when students are logging in, we wanted to start to close with them this knowledge gap around what it means if students are not logging in. So we have all this knowledge, this kind of very detailed historical analysis based data on uh, on what it means when students don't show up in school, right? What does that absence of physical attendance uh, uh, mean for students? And the short answer to that one has always been, it means a lot, right? We know that when students come to school less, their test performance is dramatically, uh, dramatically affected. Um, their sort of social and emotional um, well-being is often affected. At the very least, attendance is a predictor of, even if it's not a cause, and sometimes it is, but even if it's not a cause, it is very often a predictor of, uh, of the types of things uh, that we care about as educators, um, whether they be academic or social emotional. Um, we don't know if that's true for logins, right? We don't know if that's true for engaging with remote learning. We don't have the historical data on it. And so we have no way of saying, if a student misses 10% of virtual days, does that mean the same thing as missing 10% of physical days? Um, and so the second analysis we did was looking at the patterns of login behavior and the relationship between those and prior absence patterns. Um, and our findings there suggest that, not terribly surprisingly, um, they're so related that there's reason to feel confident that students not engaging in virtual learning is providing exactly the same warning signs as students not engaging in uh, sort of in-person learning. Um, uh, and again, this is very preliminary data, but when you see it, uh, I'll kind of go through go through the inferences we drew from, from that data about that. Um, so without belaboring the bullet points that you've all probably had an opportunity to read while I've been babbling, uh, I'm going to dive into the, the sort of deeper dive of the analysis. So the first part, as I noted, where and when are students logging in? Uh, and we started geographically. So uh, in some census tracts, uh, nearly a third of students never logged in in the four week period that this analysis is for. Uh, we've actually done this analysis now over a much longer period than that, um, but we're showing you the example, just a, a kind of discrete four week chunk example. Um, but a third of the students never logged in at all in four weeks. Um, and where that takes place is super concentrated in regions of the city. And one of the things that happens when you show this to the district, and by the way, I, I should also note all of this data has been modified. The patterns are the patterns are correct. The findings are are legitimate, but we've modified all the data to hide the district that this was for, uh, including this geographic map. This is not the actual map of any city in the United States. Just in case somebody's wondering about that, um, we've modified the map to make the patterns remain, but not not allow it to be identified. Um, but what you what the districts see when you show them this is they know exactly what that really dark purple area is. They know exactly where in the city, and they immediately begin to ge generate hypotheses 
about why they have such high rates of not logging it at all. Um, uh, and you know, some of them are obvious. Some of them we had to dive a little deeper into, and I'll share that in a little bit. Um, but for the most part, uh, districts weren't surprised at the fact or the pattern that they saw here. That you know, this this area that my laser pointer is on here of the city was more um, had higher rates of students not logging in, and this area had much much lower rates. Um, they were a little surprised by the degree of that, right? If you think about um, even the like highest that your most absent students, uh, if you have a 33% chronic absent rate, you know, those a large portion of those students are still showing up nine out of every 10 days, right? They're missing 10% of school, but they're missing one day every two weeks. What we're seeing here is a third of students, one third of every student in the district didn't log in a single time in a four week period, right? So we're talking, we're seeing just a degree of difference that's that's much bigger than anybody sort of anticipated or at least anybody hoped for. Um, when we break that down by grade level, um, we sort of we sort of see uh, similar patterns to what we had seen in uh, with attendance, but um, but again, the extremes are a little bit different. So uh, one thing to note is that the you know in pre-K um, attendance rates are generally a little bit worse, uh, or sometimes much worse than even kindergarten. Um, but here we see a complete lack of engagement with with online. There's so many factors uh, that go into that, not least that pre-K students aren't predominantly using virtual uh, or online tools to do remote learning. Uh, and so this is not by any means uh, 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 evidence that like they had the opportunity, they had the access and parents didn't. Um, so really what, you, what you're seeing here is also evidence of how the district rolled out virtual learning. Um, but the point is not necessarily for us to draw conclusions, right? The point is for us to present data that the district can use with its own knowledge to generate uh, generate its own conclusions about what they're seeing, or at least generate its own hypotheses uh, to dive into a little bit deeper. Um, we, we were curious if the two patterns were sort of consistent, which is to say the pattern, the regional patterns and the grade level patterns uh, were consistent. And generally speaking, they are. Uh, what this data, this deck is showing, or this, this slide is showing, is that the areas of the city that had the higher absence rates or the higher non-login rates are basically the same, but the degree of not logging in is much, much higher in, in K to two. Um, and so that's not exactly surprising given the first two slides. Um, but this is when we started to get into the when question uh, that is really important for the district we work with in developing its plans for next year, right? They're planning at least some portion of virtual learning and they want to know when they should focus on uh, assignment delivery, when you should have Zoom meeting, Zoom classes, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so we were able to unpack this a little bit by looking at uh, not only what day of the week, which is what you see here, the login rates were the highest, uh, but also the um, the times within a given day that login rates were the highest. Um, one thing to note about this is this is not reflecting a lot of synchronous learning, right? There's not a ton of like concurrent Zoom calls taking place because this reflected the first four weeks of online learning. And in those first four weeks, the district hadn't yet set up a lot of synchronous uh, learning opportunities. And so when you see login rates in the vicinity of 33 to 34% on any given day, that doesn't mean teachers were having classes with 34% of students showing up. Um, it does, however, mean that on any given day, 60 something percent of students were not doing any online instruction. They weren't logging into anything at all, um, which is interesting. The other interesting thing I think here um, is that we have a huge drop off in engagement by Friday. Uh, and so what you see um, uh, on, especially by that fourth week, is uh, rates in the like seven percentage point lower for Friday than on Monday of that same week. Uh, and that's a pattern that we've seen kind of be consistent across, but it does seem to be getting a little bit worse or seem to get a little bit worse towards the end of the year. And that has obvious implications for uh, for how we structure assignments and, and things like that uh, going forward. 
Likewise, uh, we see that logins are peaking uh, in the middle of the day. And this, again, is not enormously surprising, um, but this is true across all grade levels. And I'll show the next slide in a second because this pattern is basically the same no matter what grade level you're looking at. Um, but what you're not seeing is kids logging in at the time that they would have shown up in school. If a high schooler started school at 7.15, they were not logging in at 7.15, right? Your high schoolers were logging in much, much later in the day with your sort of modal login window being between 11 and 11 and 2 p.m. or so. And again, this has implications for uh, if you're going to have synchronous, synchronous opportunities, when should you have those synchronous opportunities? Probably not at 7 a.m. Um, based on this. Uh, in fact, you see way more students logging in at 11 p.m. Uh, than you do uh, logging in at even 8 a.m. Uh, and so that, again, that has, that has some implications. Uh, before I get into the next sort of uh, chunk of slides, I want to pause and see if there's any any questions in the chat window at this moment. Hi, Dave. Uh, there are no questions yet, and I just want to encourage folks to use that chat box as you um, have questions or reflections. I know um, for me personally, this uh, be, being a mother of two children, um, these slides resonated with me as I thought about when we logged in. And so um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about this, what resonates, um, and your questions as well. So feel free to use that. Oh, we do have a question. What is the sample size of this data? Uh, that is a great question. Um, the uh, I do have that. Uh, Lisa, I'm again, I can't see the, the window with everybody's faces, but Lisa, if you're on and you can chase down the exact sample size, um, uh, please, please either just holler out or put it in the chat window. Um, I can tell you that this is a district uh, of uh, about 28,000 students. Um, and uh, the so that's roughly the, the sample size, uh, which is to say that's roughly the denominator in all of these. Uh, so when you're looking at uh, sort of shares of uh, like, uh, let me go back here, um, the share of students logging in by uh, by a given day. So on like Monday or Wednesday, April 8th, if 32% were logging in, that's 32% of all enrolled students. So 32% of 28,000 or so, uh, roughly 10,000 students, give or take 9,000 students in each one of those bars. Um, but if we can, we can probably get that exact answer. So. Um, if, if somebody on our team can, can chase that down and drop that in the chat window, that'd be awesome. Great. We also have a question from Sarah. Um, are the logins represented from one platform or multiple platforms? Perfect question. Yeah, we're, that's one of the considerations we'll go over in the end. This is one platform. Uh, the platform we're working off of here is called Clever, uh, which has, I think, something like a 40% a saturation rate in Ohio, something like that. So not a not a majority of districts using it, but Clever is a single sign-on platform um, that essentially captures, that districts use to route uh, logins to many different platforms. So if a district's using, you know, iReady or Map or any other sort of online learning tool, uh, students are logging in through Clever. Um, there's a little bit of a hole, uh, a little bit of a hole in the data for this district in that um, this, some teachers did use um, Google Google Classroom, which is not captured by this. And some teachers did have Zoom meetings with students, and neither of those are routed through the Clever single sign-on platform. Uh, so there's a little bit of a miss, but in this particular district, um, that was a big minority, uh, or a small minority of the students was, um, uh, was using, or uh, teachers were using that platform. Um, but one of the biggest considerations for how to process and analyze this data is uh, is how consistently the, the platforms that are generating the data are being used across a whole district. This is infinitely easier, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but this is infinitely easier if the district has a single platform that everybody is required to use across all grade levels, and you can just pull the data in one shot. Um, over the last three to four months, that has not been the case by any means. There's been sort of a uh, a buckshot approach uh, to, you know, use whatever you have, get stuff out to students and families uh, and do it however you can and maybe capture some information in like a Google Sheet or a Google Form on the back end somehow. Um, but going forward, what we're really expecting to see just from our work with partners 
is uh, the much more consistent use of uh, uh, much more consistent guidance across districts of, of tools. And uh, and I'll note uh, a little bit later, but the easiest thing to do is actually not necessarily a single sign on platform like this, um, but the learning using the data on the back end of a learning management system uh, to capture logins. You could structure the exact same analyses, but a learning management system would likely allow you to capture a lot more of what's actually happening uh, than a single sign on in a place that has sort of multiple ways you can uh, multiple ways you can log in. Great. We've had a couple more questions and thank you, Lisa, for responding to some of those in the chat box. That's really helpful. Um, we also have a question uh, from Andrea. Did this district have some buildings that were doing pencil paperwork during remote learning? Did the district provide one on one devices during this time? Uh, yes to both. Um, and I, I, I should qualify that uh, that I don't have at my fingertips like flawless data from this district on all of the other things that they did. Um, but I can answer generally that yes, some uh, some grade levels, uh, particularly the younger grade levels, were using um, pencil and paper, uh, which is again reflected in sort of that pre-K and kindergarten like particularly low login rates. Um, but um, but again, the norm, the guidance district wide was online learning, um, but teachers were given the freedom to use paper and pencil, and so there was some sporadic paper and pencil usage. Um, as far as giving out one-to-one -one devices, this district did make attempts to do both, uh, to deliver one-to-one -one devices and to deliver uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, or other sort of ways of, of accessing the internet uh, for students that didn't have it. Um, we never we we never pinned down or they never pinned down the actual rates uh, of those things. Like uh, some of our partners in Ohio, for example, were able to say like. You know, we got to every single household, or we got to all but like twelve households. Um, and our smaller partners can say things like that. This district is a little bigger and never quite was able to pin that down. Um, but they did get pretty close to one one device per household, and they were finding ways to make Wi-Fi available throughout the city. Um, one thing I'll note, though, is that uh, I'll show a trend trend slide in a second. Um, as they were rolling these things out the rates of online participation were not going up. So one of the interesting things you see over a four week period that we're showing here is that by the end of that four week period, a lot of the devices had been delivered. A lot of that, those Wi-Fi hotspots had been distributed and you're not seeing any upticks in actual login rates. And that obviously generates all kinds of hypotheses about what's driving the, uh, the login or non-login. Um, but the hypothesis that it was a lack of ability to, you know, a lack of a device or a lack of access to the internet um, is a little bit, a little bit weakened by the fact that we didn't see any change in, in rates uh, over time. So I'll, I'll go to those slides in a little bit. Any other questions? Not at this point. Thanks everyone for adding those questions to the chat box. Yeah, thanks so much. Great questions. Uh, so next I'm just going to jump into uh, who's logging in. Okay, so this is a sort of the more granular student level look by student characteristic of who's logging in to see if there's any patterns that the district should either be concerned about or or at the very least that the district could act on. Um, and I'll note here uh, that there are some jarring patterns. The nature, the, the patterns themselves were not sort of jarring to these districts, like were terribly surprising, I should say. But the degree, uh, the, the, the degree of difference between subgroups uh, was definitely disturbing to the district. Uh, and so they've started doing, we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but they are using this data to sort of draft their plans for this upcoming year and do some targeted outreach based on what they're seeing. Um, um, but, uh, but it's not that the patterns are surprising, it's that the degree of difference is surprising. Uh, so starting with students eligible for a free and reduced price lunch, uh, we see here, uh, that they were less likely to log in. Uh, that's about 12 percentage points less likely to log in. Um, uh, and there's sort of two things notable here, uh, in addition to this 12 percentage point gap. Uh, one is that um, this is these are rates of login across an entire four week span, which means even amongst students not eligible for free and reduced price lunch, 9% of students didn't log in a single time in four weeks. Um, and on the eligible side, uh, that number is far, far scarier, which is one in five students didn't log in a single time uh, in, in a four week window. Um, 
And that is way, way, way different than chronic absenteeism, right? The pattern's basically the same, right? There's uh, students eligible for free and reduced price lunch generally miss a little bit more school, uh, sometimes a lot more school, um, but you don't see one in five students missing uh, an entire four week span uh, like this. So, so again, the degree is the scary thing here that, for the district. Um, the areas of the city with higher concentrations of students eligible for free and reduced price lunch generally had those lower login rates. Um, so this again is just trying to dive into some hypotheses that were generated by looking at that initial uh, uh, map of the, the city's login rates. Obviously one hypothesis was those higher concentration areas, those areas that are that have purple, uh, a lot of purple, which is a high share of students not logging in, uh, were also uh, areas that had high rates of free and reduced price lunch. Uh, and nothing in these charts really disabuses, uh, disabuses us of that hypothesis. Um, uh, but again, this has serious implications for how districts are targeting their outreach efforts. Uh, we see a similar thing for students with uh, IEPs. Um, again, students with IEPs uh, are very, very likely to not have logged in at all. Uh, there's a little bit more of a qualifier here uh, on this data, which is, uh, I don't know who said it because I can't see the chat window, but the point about um, is there paper and pencil going on? Uh, it is very possible that there are is a greater rate of paper and pencil usage for students with IEPs, uh, especially those students of IEPs that would make uh, sort of independent or virtual learning difficult. Um, and so again, it's not terribly surprising to see students with IEPs uh, having being less likely to log in than students without them. Uh, but this is nevertheless a sort of jarring number, which is almost one in three students with an IEP never logged in to any platform at all. Um, so I'm going to pause there uh, and I'll note uh, as I pause here uh, for questions in the chat window, I'll note that uh, we have more detailed slides on all of these things. They're living in the appendix just in the interest of time. I didn't want to kind of waste your time going through every analysis we did, um, but we have a whole appendix of slides. And if somebody's really, really interested in, in a few other things that we did, um, we sort of have a whole mit, a whole catalog of additional slides that we generated for this district as well. But uh, but for now, we're going through sort of the high level takeaways for you. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, there are no additional questions in the chat box at the moment. And just to let you know, Lisa has been um, following up with the questions about the sample size. So thank you again, Lisa, for um, providing that information in the chat. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, so this is a, a similar thread, but one of the things that we wanted to see after seeing that there were these kind of very obvious gaps between uh, different groups of students, we wanted to see if those gaps were persistent or if over the four week span, you know, students started to catch up or get a little bit further off. And it looks like those gaps are basically persistent, uh, which is to say the gaps remain roughly the same size, almost no matter how we measured it, uh, over the entire four week window. Uh, so the average number of days logged in per week um, by whether or not a student was eligible for uh, free and reduced price lunch um, uh, stayed you know, roughly one day less, uh, one whole day per week less uh, across the entire time span. Um, but the other thing I'll note is, uh, is back to what I had uh, alluded to before, uh, that even though the district is ramping up efforts to give folks access uh, or to address issues of access, uh, over this four week window, you're actually seeing the number of days a week students were logging in decline, not increase. Um, uh, these are really small differences, so we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't necessarily jump out of this and say that decline is huge. Kids are really stopping engaging, um, but it's directionally enough for us to say they're not dramatically increasing and engaging either, right? That's very, very unlikely from this data. Um, the, uh, I'm gonna dive into the comparison between chronic absence and, uh, uh, and login rates, um, but this is sort of a preview of that, showing that these gaps are actually astronomical if you look at students who are previously chronically absent. Uh, your average student who is chronically, trending chronically absent before COVID-19 logged in a, roughly once a week uh, on average. Um, and I'll show you in a second, but 
that's that average is brought down by obviously a fair share of students who didn't log in at all. Um, but even the students who were logging in weren't logging in at these like really high rates. So you're talking about, you know, students who even on the on the high end were missing one in five days of school, 20 percent, you know, double chronically absent, 20 percent absence rate are missing are not doing any kind of uh, educational engagement of any kind for four days out of every five. Right. You're talking about a very dramatic increase in uh, uh, in uh, d disengagement. Um, and again, these patterns are just very persistent, right? We're not seeing any kind of gap closing or any changes over time that would suggest that this got better as folks got used to virtual learning. Uh, so I'll just pause again, see if there's any questions uh, before diving into the, the absences. Um, we do have some questions. Great. Uh, so I'll, I'll read you um, Nick's comment here. Um, these analytics are all really helpful for us to think about measuring a minimum bar participation. Have you had any thoughts on how you would try to use any of this data to tackle active engagement in learning? How do we start to differentiate those who just log in and maybe walk away from their computer versus those who log in and are active in the platforms? Great question. That is a great question and worth way more than 20 minutes we have left to discuss. <laughs> but um, but that is literally the whole purpose of this, right? Answering that question is why we're doing the analysis in the first place. And so the short answer is we've definitely, and our partners, uh, our partners especially, are giving thought to exactly that question. Um, we have no, you know, no concrete, nothing concrete developed on this yet. I think we're going to be, uh, you know, getting into more of the data from this upcoming year uh, before we can really figure out exactly how to generate analyses that that drive those deeper dives. Um, that said, uh, we have a couple of considerations around this that are that are useful. One is uh, single sign on platforms uh, are not great at helping answer the question you just asked. And I think the name was Nick, if I'm not mistaken. Um, those the single sign on platform tells us when a student logged in, not how long they logged in for, not what specific platform within it that they logged into. Um, it is a very limited data set that is the functional equivalent of telling you that the kid opened the door to the school. Right. It's not telling you which classes the kid went to. It's not telling you that the kid, uh, you know, stayed all day. Um, it's literally capturing the same thing as if a kid walked into school, opened the door, the door captured that he walked in, turned around and walked out. That would look exactly the same in this data as if the kid walked in the door, sat in, engaged in every single one of their classes. And so, uh, so platforms like this are not going to answer those questions. What they're going to do is tee up those questions, and then you're going to need to find additional data sources to dive deeper into that. Um, a, a something like a learning management system will be much, much better at questions like that. Right? A learning management system is going to capture not just whether a student logged in at all, although it will capture that. Uh, it'll also, in most cases, you know, Canvas, Schoology, sort of these leading ones, uh, will generally give you reports about the types of interactions students had within the learning management system. Are they submitting assignments? Um, are they, uh, you know, are they, uh, if they have multiple courses within their learning management system, are they uh, addressing each of those courses? Are they checking all of those things? Um, so you'll start to be able to get uh, with learning management systems and things like that, better data than what we have right now. Um, and then there's this kind of third part of the question is, even with the better data, how do you address it once you've learned, or at least have a really strong hypothesis that students just aren't actually engaging much, right? What are those, um, like, what are those things you can start doing to address this hypothesis that uh, even if they're logging in or, or if they're not logging in, that students just aren't engaging in their learning and we should be seriously worried about this. Um, and that's uh, that's where sort of these processes that we've developed over time with early warning systems come in. Um, but for anybody that's familiar with how early warning works, um, you use the early warning system not necessarily to, to diagnose exactly what's happening or why, but to identify the set of students with whom, for whom you it's most urgent to be able to answer those questions and then to develop a strategy for answering those questions for that specific group of students, right? Um, and we envision using this kind of thing exactly the same way. Uh, and it's basically the same way we've always used attendance with our partners. Um, we, we do diagnostics on attendance to identify sort of 
the share of students and which students aren't showing up in school at all. Uh, and then we dive deeper with that set of students to develop interventions that are customized to address the reasons that those students aren't or aren't showing up in school. Uh, we would envision doing literally the same thing. In fact, we are envisioning doing exactly the same thing with our partners this upcoming year. Um, I know that's probably not the most most satisfying an answer. A lot of it's a lot of sort of we, we are going to have to work together to figure this out. Um, but that's uh, at this moment, that's that's the world we're in. Uh, was there any any follow up questions to that? Great, thank you, Dave. Uh, no, there are not uh, follow up questions at this point. Great. Um, so one of the things that is is sort of disappointing, but also encouraging about our ability to use this data in the absence of um, of the the physical in person attendance that we've always had uh, is that. The patterns we, we found that the patterns of uh, login and the patterns of absent prior absenteeism are sufficiently similar that even though we don't exactly know what it means when a student log in, logs in um, again to, to Nick's question, even though we don't know how long the student was logging in, we don't know how long or what they were doing exactly when they logged in. Um, we have the patterns suggest that uh, there's there may be a similar level of sort of early warning canary in the coal mine uh, sort of predictability of not logging in at all to not showing up in school. Uh, so high absences, highly correlated with not logging in. Uh, so we started geographically like we did uh, throughout uh, the process. Um, and what you can see here is that the share of students not logging in has high concentrations around the city in a very, very similar pattern to the share of students uh, uh, sorry, the average number of absences per student. And this this chart, we don't have like the 40 different iterations of these charts here for, for today, but this chart looks very similar if you just did the percentage of students chronically absent prior to uh, through March 15th when the school shut down. Um, so preliminarily, the hypothesis that patterns of absenteeism, uh, sorry, patterns of login reflect patterns of attendance, uh, this data does nothing to sort of change that hypothesis. Um, this is the side, though, that really drives home the risk that we face uh, in a virtual world of sort of losing touch altogether uh, with these students who, even when they were chronically absent, we still had contact with on a, you know, mostly more often than not. Again, a student who's chronically absent, you know, misses 10 percent of days, shows up one, you know, misses one day out of every 10. Right? So nine days out of every two weeks, you get to put eyes on that student. You get to engage with them. You get to, you know, uh, even if they're not fully engaged in their instruction, you see if they're OK, things like that. And we're not seeing that equivalent uh, anywhere near that equivalent in uh, in the remote setting. Uh, so what you're seeing here is that for students who are chronically absent before uh, the school shut down on March 15th, in a four week window, fully one in three never logged in a single time. And for the most part, at a, especially if you're in a larger district, uh, trying to do sort of one on one outreach over a four week window to catch up with all of these students just to make sure you can kind of put eyes on them and make sure everything's OK um, is very, very difficult to do, right? Um, especially if you don't have perfect phone numbers before COVID, if you don't have addresses. And this is one of the things that Attendance Works has been really hammering about is we really need those phone numbers and addresses now more than ever. And this is the reason is those natural opportunities to connect with this, your most at risk students um, are not arising in a virtual setting in the same way. Uh, and so again, are we surprised or was the district surprised that there was a gap between chronically absent students and not chronically absent students when it came to logging in? Of course not. Um, but a 22 percentage point difference in, in, in other words, 22 percent uh, percentage points more of students never logging in a single time in four weeks, um, that's a jarring difference, right? That's a really big, uh, really big number. Uh, and so that's that's driving a lot of sort of uh, continuous improvement thinking on this district's part about right, what's causing this? How do we target it? How do we address it? Um, neighborhoods with higher absence rates. Uh, so this is just a sort of correlational look at the same thing. Um, but what we found was that, uh, not terribly surprisingly, that the neighborhoods that had the higher absence, absence rates had a higher percent of students who hadn't logged in. And the most important takeaway here is look how straight that line is. 
right? The, the predictability of prior absence rate, or sorry, how, how well prior absence rate predicts whether a student's logging in um, is reflected in that like very, very clear straight line uh, that you see here. And we have sort of the, the flip side of that, um, which is uh, the, this, the neighborhoods that had students with higher absence had lower overall rates of login. Uh, so these are slightly different measures of the same thing, and all it does is sort of flip the, flip the chart. Um, but again, you see very, very clear, these dots are tightly clustered around a very straight line, all of which suggests that um, we, to the extent that we can use absenteeism to predict all these other things that we care about, it seems that we can use absences to de facto predict absenteeism, I'm uh, sorry, uh, logins to predict absenteeism. And if that those hold as tightly as they may, they, they appear to here, um, there's at least reason to be optimistic that virtual logins are uh, are going to be a strong early warning indicator once we actually start to be able to, to do those kinds of analyses directly. So I'm going to pause there um, and see if there's any questions about the relationship between absenteeism, prior absenteeism, and logins. There are no questions at this point. And we've got about 10 minutes left in our time together. Um, I just want to, if you do have questions, continue to put them in the chat box, but we'll also have opportunities for a follow up as Dave alluded to before. So if something comes to you later or after, um, we'll make sure we get those questions answered. Thanks, Heather. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick review of the data sources. Uh, nothing, nothing crazy or groundbreaking here. These are all data sources that, uh, that folks will will have access to. Um, so as I noted, the data we got was a, uh, a, a single export from a single sign-on platform called Clever, uh, and that Clever platform was designed to provide uh, access to sort of single, single sign-on access to digital resources. Um, the, um, the data received, as I noted, is literally just a timestamp of when students logged in. Um, it is, doesn't tell you duration of login. It doesn't tell you what platform within Clever that they logged into, anything like that. Time period was four weeks. Um, and uh, again, as I alluded to, um, to the extent that they were doing using other online platforms like Google Classroom or Zoom, which don't log in through Clever, um, we're not, this wouldn't capture that. And so you could imagine sort of systematically undercounting uh, participation. Uh, if you were in a district that was using multiple platforms and you only pulled the data from one. Um, I'll note that Google Classroom is not terribly easy to pull the data from. So if you wanted to pull it from two platforms, one being Clever, one being Google Classroom, and merge those together, you could. Uh, it would be a little tedious, but there is a free provider who's made, tried to make things like that easier. Um, uh, and Zoom is the same way. It's not the easiest thing to pull participation out of, uh, but it is technically possible. Um, uh, so this all highlights that, uh, and I think this is very consistent with the guidance ODE gave on tracking attendance, um, but having a, a sort of consistent platform throughout the district that is going to be the keeper of uh, sort of the analog to physical attendance, the keeper of did the student have in any way, was, was the student in any way exposed to their educational opportunities uh, on a given day uh, is really important, right? So. Um, we strongly recommend sort of a district-wide learning management system uh, or some equivalent to that where every student has an expectation of logging into that learning management system in the same way we have an expectation that every student show up physically in a building right now. Uh, and so uh, we very, very strongly recommend that. It'll make it much, much easier for districts to do the type of uh, sort of intervention targeting informative uh, data analysis that uh, that you need. It's not impossible if you don't do that, uh, but it is very, very difficult. Um, the geographic data we get, got is we start with student addresses straight out of the student information system. So our districts send us a file that has all the student info, including their address. Um, we then uh, use geocoding data from the Center for Geographic Analysis at Harvard. Um, the, the sort of the, the geocoding data is not itself something that has a cost like you can you can get that from anywhere. Um, it's sort of the the effort of taking an address 
using geocoded information and combining those two, two things. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, for the demographic data, we use a student attributes file uh, and a student school year file. Uh, and again, these are both just ordinary polls out of the student information system. Um, we did this all out of data that districts would be sending anyway or using anyway out of their student information systems. Uh, and then the attendance data is, a, again, just the ordinary daily attendance file that you can extract from pretty much every student information system districts might use. Um, and uh, I'll also note that even though this was not necessarily Ohio district that we did this for, um, all of the data files we used for this, we get from all of our Ohio districts. Uh, everything except Clever because our Ohio districts weren't using Clever in the same way, but um, but all the other kind of background data, the attendance data, um, the student demographic files, the attendance files, those are all, we get those all in a way that we could use for this from all of our Ohio districts. Um, I'm just going to combine these, but uh, obviously, Heather, don't be shy about um, hollering at me if there's any questions as I go through. Uh, but I do want to make sure we cover this before the time ends. Um, yeah, we do have one okay. question that I'm going to I'm going to share with you. I feel like it, it's going to be a longer answer, so we might have to come back to it and share information afterwards. But okay. there's um, a great question about have you found any successful interventions based on this data? So. <laughs> You can um, think about that one while you're talking about methods and tools. And yeah. just wanted you to know that that's up there. Awesome. So it's actually a short answer right now, the direct version of that, which is not yet. So we are, even though our pilot cycle is very, very short and only takes you know somewhere around eight weeks at the short end, 12 weeks at the long end to figure out what works, we haven't had anywhere near enough time to do that uh, with this district or any of the districts we've done this kind of thing with. Uh, so, so the short answer is we have not yet actually found anything that does this. We have all kinds of hypotheses and we can talk about those, but we do not have any kind of concrete evidence on this yet. Um, so the, the, the specific methods. Um, so we start by geocoding the student data, as I noted, uh, and that involves sort of your basic cleaning of addresses, literally just making sure they look like addresses because sometimes they're open fields and SISs. You got to put the commas in place, things like that. Um, uh, and then we use a geocoding program called ArcGIS. Um, uh, and that, that, does, that is not a free tool. Um, it is a really good one, but it's not free. Uh, I noted in the bottom, uh, in this, uh, there's a little asterisk down here, um, that uh, there are free versions. I am literally just made up or gave an example of one called QGIS. It's totally open source and free. Um, but... Uh, and, and you can do everything that we've done in this with with sort of off the shelf free programs. Um, the bigger issue is kind of knowing how to use them and, and all that. And, uh, and if anybody is really interested in diving into that, we can uh, we can do some follow up on that. Um, we create a final analysis file by merging all of the different files. So we take the geographic file that includes all the geocoded uh, data, the demographic file, the attendance file and the single sign on data or learning management system data. And we merge those. Um, we use uh, in-house uh, for the merger. I believe we used Stata, but you could use Stata uh, or R for this. Um, or honestly, as I put in the asterisk, any other um, uh, any other platform, um, statistical platform, will make this easy. You can use SAS if you use that. If, if you use SPSS, you can use that. They can all merge files. Um, there's nothing magical about how Stata or R do it that can't be done by other platforms. That said. Um, um, it would be very difficult to do this in something like Excel. It can be done, um, but it would be extremely painful potentially. Uh, so, uh, so it is worth kind of figuring out how to use any of the other platforms to do it. If you already know how awesome, we do recommend just use whatever you know how to use. Don't learn a new thing. Uh, if you are going to learn a new thing, I personally recommend R simply because it's free, uh, free off the shelf. Um, Geographic analysis, sort of making the, the the pretty pictures that Rachel made with all the map, the heat maps on them, uh, uses uh, off the shelf uh, uh, packages in R. Uh, we noted the names of those packages in here. If you're not comfortable or familiar with R, those won't be terribly terribly uh, noteworthy to you. But uh, if you use R and when you use R, it's really 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 uh, clear how to download those packages and use them. Um, the uh, other pat, you can do this in other things. You do not need to use special R packages. Like I said, if you're comfortable in Stata or SAS or SPSS, you theoretically can do this. Uh, we just happen to use R to do it. 
Um, and then the descriptive analysis, that's probably the least interesting thing of all. Um, any, any, any package can do it, or if you had a large, uh, if you somehow managed to get all this into a single Excel file, you could theoretically generate a lot of these graphs and stuff uh, in Excel. Um, so in our last minute, I just want to kind of gloss over these, these considerations. Um, so I noted this already, but how complete your data is is really critical. If only a third of your students are supposed to use Clever, it wouldn't be surprising to find out that 20% of your students, uh, or only 20% of your students logged in. Um, you know, you need to make sure you know the denominator when you're doing this analysis. And the easiest thing in the world is if you have sort of a district-wide mandate to use one, one platform. Um, do you understand the coding of the data that you're getting? Uh, so it's one thing to, to pull data. It's another thing to know what that data says. Um, and you know, we've, we've started working with some districts assignment data, uh, which is, you know, you'd hope would say assignment completed, assignment not completed. But it turns out the coding is a little more complicated than that. And without going back to the district, we actually didn't know exactly what all of the numbers in the, in the file meant. Uh, so you know, understanding the coding of your data and making sure they're consistent is, is very helpful. Um, but the most important thing potentially of all, once you actually fundamentally have the data available and know how to process it, um, is making sure that you're generating analyses that the districts can use. Right? And so what we're really trying to do is generate actionable analysis. What is the what is the finding, and how is the district going to use that finding to serve students and families? Um, and then finally, uh, if you can't do it relatively routinely, it's not going to be super useful. So if it takes you three weeks to prepare analysis every time you have to do this, uh, or four weeks, and you can't sort of set it up so that it's reasonably automated, it's going to be very hard to use it actionably. You're not going to be able to see changes in patterns quickly enough, uh, things like that. And so another main consideration is. Can you do it routinely? Can you spin this analysis up and then sort of replicate it relatively quickly? Um, so I know we're at time. Thank you so much for bearing, bearing with this. Uh, I have a few extra minutes, so I'm happy to stay on um, uh, and answer any questions that are already in the chat window or any new ones that come up. I can stay on for a little while longer. Um, but, uh, but for those of you who are like having to jump off right now, I uh, just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to this. Thanks for engaging and asking questions. Please don't be shy about reaching out. Uh, you can reach out through ODE. Uh, you can reach out directly to us. Uh, we do have Twitter, as I noted, so that's a, a great way to reach out to us too. Um, and uh, we do have a very, very brief survey. Shouldn't take more than three or four minutes to fill out. If you have the time uh, and can spare it, we would love to get your feedback on this. We do use that to sort of uh, drive drive the work we do and, and try to improve these things going forward. So uh, so if you can take a minute or two or three uh, to fill out that survey, we very much appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, just want to say thank you to Dave, to Rachel Lee, and to Lisa for all the work that they put into preparing these analyses and this presentation this morning. And also just say again, thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. I hope it was helpful and interesting and generated some new ideas. And I look forward to hearing those ideas and engaging in this conversation um, over the, the year to come because we know it's a complex topic and we're all going to continue to learn together about how best to look at this information and use this information. And so um, this is a, a drop in the bucket of the, the kinds of conversations that we can have about this topic. Um, so thank you so much, and we will, as I said, make this recording available to all of you and share the slides. And if you have questions after today, please feel free to follow up either with Proving Ground or with the department. And with that, um, we don't have questions at this moment, Dave, but we can we can certainly wait a little bit and make sure we catch everything. Thank you. Well, while we wait, I, I can dive into a little more depth in that uh, the answer I answered really shortly about are there interventions that uh, that work to address these things. Um, the the short answer again is is we don't know yet. Um, we haven't done with our partners, and to our knowledge, we haven't seen any of it else do a sort of rigorous evaluation of any any of these efforts that have taken place since since school shut down for COVID. Um, we do, however, have a lot of knowledge we've generated pre-COVID that we have strong hypotheses uh, would 
uh, generate lessons that apply uh, in, a, in a virtual world. Uh, things like, um, you know, we have, we've identified small behavioral nudges that at relatively low cost and effort on the district's part do seem to actually improve attendance. Um, things like sending personalized robocalls every six weeks, uh, we saw three to four percent, in some cases up to 10 percent, uh, improvements uh, or reductions in absences uh, based on simply setting up those automated robocalls um, as long as they were personalized. And while we don't know if we'd see anywhere near the same type of effects uh, for, say, virtual learning, let's say we send robo district sent robocalls trying to populate, get students to log into an online platform, um, we have no way of knowing if we get the same results. But we do, but we can hypothesize based on the root causes that those robocalls were addressing that uh, that it's worth trying uh, and systematically figuring out. And uh, because those root causes may be the same, right? If a student is not, if a younger student's not showing up because their parents not aware of how much, how important it is that they show up or how often that they were actually showing up or the impacts of a given day of not showing up, um, they may be not logging their kid in for the same reason, their student in for the same reason. And so, uh, so there's reason to believe uh, that at least for some parents, those robocalls would be would be affected. Um, so we have lots of hypotheses like that, um, but I have no no hard uh, or rigorous evidence either way. It'll be interesting to see though how that all unfolds as you're able to see more data. And that's what I was thinking about as you were showing the the weekly data points. Um, and thinking about how that's really interesting to look at from just a descriptive perspective, but also that those are the data points that will be um, most valuable as districts start to make changes. And um, you kind of alluded to that when you talked about, you know, they they distributed the one to one devices and it really didn't ha seem to have a significant effect as they looked at the information over time. So um, that'll be really fascinating. Yep. Yeah, very much looking looking forward to having sort of more comprehensive data on this kind of stuff. Um, Lori noted that several districts are planning parent trainings this fall to engage and inform parents with online platforms um, so that parents feel more empowered and, you know, aren't sure. We're not sure if that will make an impact, but going to try it and see if that works. And that's that's what a lot of everyone is going to be doing this year, right? Iterating and learning um, and adjusting as we go. Absolutely. All right. Well, I don't see new questions here, but thank you, Dave, very much. And um, Brittany, thank you, too. I know you're still online. Thank you very much for helping to monitor everything and keep things running smoothly. Absolutely. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect end to a COVID webinar. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So appropriate. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day.